from me. Uh, okay. I'd like to hand over to Paul from Google. Great, and we'll mic's up. Thanks, guys. It's a massive audience today. It's great to see you all here, and I'm sure it gets very, very hot later on. Um, so, as Sam said, social is very, very exciting this year. Um, you know, we've got lots of new platforms launching. We've got Google+, Plus, Pinterest. Um, it's a very, very new, vibrant world out there. Um, the other interesting thing is it's all about uh, social change in the real world. So the Arab Spring and a bit more scarily the London riots. Um, social media is always seen as a catalyst to change these things. So we've got an agenda today over two hours of reflecting that mixture of what the real world means for social and vice versa. And also looking at how, for example, Google Plus is, is changing um, the way we do things um, at Google and with our customers. So our first, um, our first speaker is Robin Dunbar, Professor Robin Dunbar. Very exciting. He is the first person I've met with a number named after him. And Robin, how many people are named after numbers who are still living? For only five people in the world um, are alive, have a name, number named after them. So that's, that's pretty impressive. Um, he is the director of Oxford University's Institute of Cognitive and Evolutionary Anthropology. Um, and uh, he's done a lot of work on the, the, the evolution of sociality in large mammals, including humans, obviously, and had a big impact on, on, uh, on social media thinking. Worryingly, for um, how many people have got more than 150 friends on Facebook or LinkedIn? Hands up. Okay. This man is going to make you very, very upset. Um, his title, the title of his presentation is Why the Internet Won't Get You Any More Friends. Robin Dunbar. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'm sorry to disappoint all those of you who put your hands up for having more than 150 friends who don't really. Um, I was also struck when you were invited to, to turn to the person next to you and introduce yourselves. The noise volume went absolutely through the roof and I went, oh, that's what social life is about. <laughs> Everybody was obviously online beforehand. All right. So, <clears throat> um, you know, ever since the internet's come online, and going back to the, the, the arrival of email uh, way back in, you know, sometime before the dinosaurs went extinct, uh, but more obviously since social networking sites have, have come on stream, as it were, you know, <clears throat> internet usage has exploded, gone through the roof. But what the techies have promised us all, if you like, right the way from, from the beginning with email was this was going to open up your social life. You were going to be able to engage with the entire global village. You could make new friends. You, you were all over the world, as it were. Uh, and the question is, has that actually happened? And can it actually happen? I'm going to try and persuade you that um, the answer is kind of yes and no, uh, but mainly no. Um, so just, just to start in the right place, these are Facebook's own data. This is in-house analysis from uh, Cameron Marlowe, one of their in-house uh, uh, sociologists. <clears throat> um, two things, really. First of all, when they looked at, uh, in the light of the stuff we'd been doing, um, uh, which I'll talk about a bit more in a minute, um, uh, looked at the number of uh, uh, friends people had on their pages. In fact, the answer was they didn't have very large numbers in general. Yes, it's a very fat tail distribution because you can have up to 5,000 friends as the, as the current limit. But in fact, reality, the modal number of friends is only somewhere around 120 to 130, and the mean is 150. Of course, you've got a few people out way out to the right with thousands of friends out there, but probably most of those are professional users. They're journalists or people, you know, writers using it as a kind of fan club base or, or that kind of thing. Um, this, this is an analysis that Cameron Marlowe did of the amount of traffic that goes on uh, on Facebook pages. And these are really just three different measures, these uh, degrees of color here, three different measures of in close, intense interaction. So, you know, sort of reciprocated exchanges between the same individuals. And who, it just who was trying sort of three different, sort of a, a very strict definition here and a very loose definition here. Blue are the boys, the pink are the girls, of course. And these, the, this is a sort of number of close friends, effectively, you have as a function of how many friends you've got signed up. So these guys here are people with about 50 friends only. Uh, these have about 150, and these have 500 or more. And you can see that although the total number of friends is increasing uh, by an order of magnitude, the actual number of core people you're exchanging 
uh, stuff with isn't. It's only going up by at most a, a function of three. And there seems to be a very small core inner group of people that you spend most of your time talking to. And that even though you know other people are looking, when you're actually posting stuff on your uh, page, you actually think you're talking to just that handful of people. That's why, exactly why people on, on trains, and, and since most of you will be from London, you'll know it uh, badly, you know, will insist on talking at the tops of their voices about the details of their personal lives on their mobiles on, on the train going home. And you think, for God's sakes, there's 100 people in this carriage listening to you. you just, we just cannot get out of the psychology, as it were, of assuming we're in a very small private conversation. And conversational groups are very small. They have an upper limit of four. If you look at natural conversational groups, you never get more than four people in a conversation unless it becomes a lecture and somebody is wagging their finger. OK. These are some of our data, which is looking at social network size and the sense of emotional closeness on a very simple kind of 0 to 10 scale with the members of your, your, your network. Um, uh, for people who were heavy users of uh, uh, Facebook and, uh, and other internet sites and people who are casual browsers, as it were. So this, this is networks, uh, network size of, of close personal friends? And the answer is there's absolutely no difference as a function of how much you use this technology, and nor was there any, any difference in the sense of emotional closeness to those, that inner core of friends. So there's some evidence here, if you like, that uh, this urban myth of hundreds and hundreds and maybe thousands of friends that people have on Facebook just isn't true. So the question is, why doesn't it work? Well, the answer goes back really to the fact that we belong to the primate family. And if you look at the size of social groups in primates, this is the average size for, these, for species. These are all individual species. There are monkeys here and apes here. And plot them against a measure of brain size. It doesn't really matter in the end what measure you use. This is the relative size of the neocortex, which is the kind of smart end of the brain. You get these very clear uh, relationships, rather nice grade lines uh, where which are quite tight, really, where the species that live in very big groups over here somewhere have very, relatively very big brains. Basically, they need a big computer to manage the number of relationships they have. So if you plug us in uh, to where we should be <clears throat> among the apes on this, you get this predicted value of about 150 that's now known as Dunbar's number. Ironically, and I do thank them enormously, it was given the name Dunbar's number on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> as a result of discussions going around among the punters as to why on earth they had all these uh, you know, huge numbers. And, and, and clearly somebody said, oh, well, this guy has this uh, theory about what the limit is. So hence Dunbar's number. OK, so there we are at 150. If, if you start to look around the world, you start to see this cropping up all over the place. This is just a sort of vague list of casual examples of that. Um, for present purposes, I'll, I'll uh, merely point out Gore-Tex, uh, who developed this. I, I, I deeply, deeply regret that Bill Gore never consulted me when he first set, set, uh, set this up, although since he did it in the 60s and I was yay high, he probably wouldn't have thought about it. But he, he, he latched, somehow latched onto the same idea. And the whole structure of Gore-Tex as a company is, rather than having an enormous hierarchical, massive management structure, they simply have separate units, each of which consists of typically 150. Absolute maximum is, is 200 for them. And they will, it, rather than build a bigger factory, what they've done is literally build a separate new factory on the parking lot next door, sometimes literally. And those factories are completely self-contained. And it means you don't have to have a management structure. It's what they call the flat lattice management structure. Uh, and of course, the, the board manages the whole thing, keeps them on track, but each factory is a completely self-contained unit. They have their own loyalties just to the factory, as it were, and it works beautifully. These are, these are our really first two attempts to look at this effect in, in real humans. Generically, these are data from hunter-gatherers, and, and, and the issue of different hunter-gatherer societies, the, it's this lot in here, which uh, this particular level of grouping, is sometimes known as a clan or regional grouping, which sits beautifully within the 95% confidence intervals around that predicted value of, uh, of 150. And this was our first attempt to sort of look at individual-based social networks in terms of Christmas cards. Who you send Christmas cards to? So it's not the number of cards you send, but the people in the, in the household. And again, uh, it's, the mean is almost exactly 150. There's a lot of variance around that, but uh, I'll come back to that in a second. That in itself is quite interesting. 
Okay. As a result of a lot of heavy mathematical cranking, which I'm not going to go into, is using the, the mass of fractals to look at sort of recurring patterns in the data, we were able to show that, in fact, so both that, those ethnographic type data, so that's looking down on a population and seeing how it's structured, if you like, looking down on the internet and seeing all the network of relationships. Uh, and that, in fact, that, that's these data here. But also, if you looked at the personal social network data from our Christmas card data, looking upwards from the individual personal social network, you get exactly the same picture. And that's here you are sitting in the middle of a, a series of circles, really, uh, that run out, and they run out way beyond 150. We know they go out to 1,500. These circles of acquaintanceship scale in ver something very close to multiples of three. So each circle is three times the size of the circle inside it. Um, <clears throat> essentially, you have a very, an inner core of very close, intimate friends of about five, uh, and then including these five, a, a circle of 15 best friends, maybe, uh, uh, and so on, until you get out to 150. This seems to demarcate people who have real relationships with, relationships of trust and obligation and reciprocity. So you owe them something. It's a relationship with history. And then as you pass beyond that, you basically get acquaintances, people you see casually, perhaps. And then this outer layer here at 1,500 appears to be the limit on the number of people whose faces you can put a name to. Um, so you know, those are, many of those will be one-way relationships, so I dare say. Uh, you know, the, for most of us, the queen sits here because we recognize her, but I suspect she probably wouldn't know who you are from Adam. Um, <clears throat> and she certainly wouldn't come to your birthday party. Um, <clears throat> okay, so this, this sort of 150 limit seems to be crucial in differentiating between those who have owe an obligation to us that we would do favors for and we would expect favors from them. Uh, from those outside that we kind of know but aren't really, don't really have that kind of relationship with. Um, and, it, it, you know, the consequence is, okay, you can sign up anybody you like on your Facebook page. Uh, you can go way beyond it. You can go, presumably these circles go on forever as far as we know until you get to six billion or whatever we currently are. Um, uh, but once you're outside this, this, this um, circle here, you're really into very casual kinds of relationships which don't really constitute proper friendships in any meaningful sense. All right, so how do we make friendships? How do primates make friendships uh, themselves, monkeys and apes? It, it seems to involve a two process mechanism, one of which involves a very emotionally intense component which is produced by this effect. It actually is a very good releaser of endorphins, which are the brain's own painkillers. They're part of the pain control mechanism. And it gives you a slight opiate high when you do it. So those of you who are uh, massage enthusiasts, you'll know about it. Those of you who prefer to go down and pump iron in the gym every night, you'll know about it too, because pumping iron, marathon running, or jogging, all these are good endorphin releases. And there are stuff we do uh, uh, to each other generally, which uh, is likewise a very good releaser of endorphins and produces this platform uh, which allows us to create a relationship within that. And that's that second component. And this is where the, the brain uh, comes into play, as it were. So I'm just going to talk you very quickly through both of these. I'm going to start with the second. This cognitive component for us really seems to have to do with what's become known as, as uh, mentalizing or mind reading uh, 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 or intentionality. The, it's the ability to understand what other people are thinking and their view of the world, as it were. And this is summarized in this kind of thing. Jack here is in first order intentionality. He believes that something's the case. Jill is in second order. She believes that Jack believes that something's the case. And this is critical. Children go through this. Uh, uh, Rubicon at, at about the age of five, and it's critical at that point. Uh, it, that's the point at which they understand how to lie convincingly, because they understand what the impact of what they say is on your mind, what you'll believe about the world. But of course, hu adult humans can do much better, and it turns out that the limit for us is something close to five orders. So we can handle five people's mental states at any one time, including our own. So something that looks a bit like that. Okay. <clears throat> This is, there's a lot of variation in the population in, in these cognitive abilities. Uh, these are some of our data, they're fairly typical. You've got this nice peak at fifth order as the limit on what people can do and quite a lot of variation around it. I wouldn't worry too much about the outer ends, that's probably artifactual. But if you then get people uh, having 
done these kind of little t tasks to benchmark what their uh, mentalizing competences are. To tell you how many friends they have, you get a picture that looks like this. Uh, this is the inner core of uh, sort of their, their, their uh, uh, 15, 10 to 15 best friends, as it were, plotted against how well they do on these kind of mentalizing tasks. There's a lot of scatter in the data, but there's a very significant relationship. Part of the scatter is due to personality differences. Part of it is due to sex differences. I am not going to tell you which sex does better than the other because half of you know and half of you, it doesn't matter. <laughs> All right, so <laughs> here, here is one of the limits on the number of friends you can have. And I do point out, if you look, remember back my first graph, Cameron Marlowe's data, uh, it was girls always had slightly bigger numbers at, on each of his measures uh, than the boys. Okay, uh, even more scary, it now turns out that both of these, both the, the mentalizing competence as the, and the number of uh, friends you have is correlated with the size of a particular part of your brain. And it's this particular bit up here above the eyeballs, the orbital frontal cortex. Uh, depending on how big that is, uh, that seems to manage uh, your ability to handle these kind of mind states, as it were. And that, in turn, limits the number of friends you can actually keep. It's like a juggler trying to keep a number of balls in the air. So this is you uh, trying to keep a number of friends in your sort of mental, virtual uh, uh, state space, as it were. Um, but we have nice neuroimaging data now showing that this, this whole area here uh, correlates with, with both of these uh, behavioral and cognitive variables. And again, this is a very fine-grained analysis looking at the core mentalizing parts of the brain, but particularly this, this bit up here just above the eyeballs, the orbital frontal cortex. So there's a hardware problem here, if you like, uh, at least by the time you, you, you're adult. I mean, it, we don't know whether you can sort of expand this by practice as a, uh, in, in childhood and adolescence. You probably can. But once you hit the mid-20s mid onwards, I'm afraid there's nothing you can do about it. <laughs> you are stuck. All right, so the other half of the story is this grooming stuff, this, which is essentially an issue about time constraints. So if you look at the amount of time that monkeys and apes spend in social interaction, which is 95% of which is, is grooming, and plot that against group size, you get a, a pretty general relationship between these two variables. The bigger the group, the more time you spend in social interaction. It's not mean they're grooming more individuals. Paradoxically, even though they're spending more time in social interaction, as group size increases, they focus more and more of that time on their core uh, friends, their core allies, basically, because this is all about social alliances. If you plug us in, the amount of time we spend in social interaction, it turns out to be, this is the average of about seven studies, it turns out to be about 20% of total daytime is spent in social interaction. And that's exactly where the upper limit seems to be for primates, because although uh, there's, there's this nice linear relationship here, it's clear that it tails off as a result of just, you know, the fact you have to live in the world and there are time constraints there. And that tail off appears to be at about 20% too. So it looks like we're using the same amount of time somehow, but using it more efficiently to increase the size of our social circle. Well, just to show you how important time is in, in your relationships, these are data, uh, um, <coughs> uh, well, uh, from several different studies, actually. This is a large data set, but we, we replicated it several times, so it's very robust. We've asked people to tell us how, essentially how often they see individual members of their social network, their personal social network. So this is, this is actually done in terms of how, how, how long ago did you last see them? So that's a sort of reciprocal of how often you see them. This is yesterday. This is, on average, eight months ago or something. And then we ask them to, to tell us how they felt about those individuals on a very simple emotional closeness scale, sort of from zero to 10. This is, I don't, you know, this is I love them dearly. This is, well, uh, I'm kind of neutral. Uh, they are, after all, in your social circle, so presumably you don't have negative uh, uh, feelings about them, so, so it's anchored at zero. But you see this nice, really uh, a clear negative relationship. The people you... Uh, value most highly you see most often in your social circle, as it were. And you can see that the contact rates, the frequency with which you actually contact them face-to-face, uh, -face, um, really drops away very, very fast from your inner core of five. I, I think the, the, altogether these two, the, five, the 15 
the circle of your innermost circle of 15 people altogether account for something in excess of 60% of your your total social time. It, 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 it's hugely uh, time costly for you. And once you're outside that, the the other people in your social network, the other uh, whatever it is, 135 or so in the average network, you see very, very rarely indeed. But look at the consequences for not seeing them on your relationships. Now, one of the things that surprised us, we, we, we kind of get the impression from Facebook that the friend's a friend's a friend of a, is a friend. I, I've kind of suggested to you that, in fact, there are kinds of friends, if you like, determined by where they lie in these circles. But there is another subdivision of your relationships, which turns out to be much more expensive prominent and important than we'd originally anticipated, and which cuts across all these. And in fact, all your circles consist of about half family and half friends. So the kinship turns out to be much more important. And on average, even in, in sort of, these are European data that we use mostly, uh, about half of the average social circle of 150 is actually extended family. Okay, so this is a longitudinal study over 18 months where people were moving away from home, uh, and we were asking them to tell us about the, the do, doing the same rating of everybody in their social circle and dividing them up into kin and to friends. Now look what happens to kin. This is the, the um, um, average closeness uh, to the whole of your social network that counters kin, and that includes in-laws, by the way. Uh, and so it's not just your mum and dad, as it were. It's all the second cousins and the lot, all averaged in together. Uh, so this is the sort of average at the start of the study here. And this is uh, nine months they repeated it, 18 months they did it all again. And you can see that kinship is incredibly robust to moving away from home. It doesn't really affect. In fact, if anything, it goes up. There's a sense in which absence really does seem to make the heart grow fonder. But look what happens to your friends. This is your original core of friends. So this is not new friends. This is the lot you started with here. Uh, you, it just drops like a stone. And it drops very, very quickly. Within a matter of months of not seeing them, these people are already starting to drop down through the layers, as it were, to the point where eventually they're just going to drop off the edge of the 150 altogether and just become acquaintances that you remember from school or, or whatever you know, a long time ago. OK, so an important issue then is how you stop, slow that rate of decay down, what you do. Well, you know, obviously, you have to talk to people or do stuff to them. Hidden in this, we discovered, slightly to our surprise, there's a massive sex difference in how you manage your relationships. So this is a cha the change in emotional closeness to each of these people across that first nine-month period when they're dropping off very fast. This is for friends only, of course. So here's zero, no change. If you're up here, uh, things have improved. If, they're down, if you're down here, um, you're less emotionally close to them. Blue are, are, the, are the boys, green are the girls. Uh, this is a score of doing stuff together. You know, it's going shopping, uh, going partying together, dancing together, helping people move house or whatever. This is talking together, so it's predominantly face-to-face, uh, -face uh, in, but it includes uh, phone call contacts and so on. And it's as a function of uh, a decrease in that whatever ac activity that you're, we're talking about uh, over those nine months, no change in the re relative amount of activity or an increase in the relative amount of activity. So let me start over here with, with the girls. Look what happens with the girls. If they're talking, if they uh, are talking together face to face, that's what holds relationships up, prevents them decaying, um, right? Uh, apparently, talking to, uh, together has no effect at all on the quality of boys' relationships, right? And you see here now why, right? Doing stuff together, down the pub, playing football, is what holds boys' relationships up, whereas doing stuff together, paradoxically, has no effect on girls' relationships. So I put it to you that this explains why digital technology from the phone to Facebook are perfectly designed for women's networking purposes. It's, it's exactly what they, their social world is designed to do. And this explains why folk wisdom has it, the urban myth, girls spend an hour on the phone at a time. Yep. And I put it to you that this explains, conversely, why, on average, boys' phone calls only last 7.3 seconds. <laughs> it, all you've got to say is, I'll see you down the pub at 7 o'clock. You know, <laughs> that's it. And then you can get on with the real business of, of relationships. Okay. 
Um, <clears throat> here's another little bit of evidence that relationships are very time costly. This is looking at uh, the inner core, that inner core of five best friends you have. Here's the typical uh, number at five. There's a lot of variation around that, of course, but the average at five. These are for people who do not have active romantic relationships at the time. But look what happens to people who have an active romantic relationship. They have an average of four. They've lost one friend. Now, since your romantic partners do not come from your inner core of five, they come from somewhere out in the nether regions or beyond, this effect means you've sacrificed two friends to, to have a romant an active romantic partner. It's just so time consuming. You just don't have time to keep those other relationships going. And quite literally, you sacrifice them. What it turns out people do, and I think what they're trying to do is optimize the balance here, the pros and cons of doing this, is they sacrifice one kin member, quite smart, because that relationship will re be reasonably robust to not being invested in, and they sacrifice one friend. They keep, typically, your set of inner core of five will consist of two friends, let's say. You'll sacrifice one and keep one. Uh, but that's just a reflection on the time costliness of, of these things. Okay, how do we get this endorphin surge uh, in, in general in, in conversations? The conversations themselves don't produce endorphin surge. Playing footy together or beating the hell out of each other, the kind of thing that boys do, that produces lots of endorphin surges. But you know, how does the rest of the social world work? The answer is we think that one of the key things is laughter. So this is, this is a diary study showing that, uh, looking at the level of satisfaction uh, with actual interactions uh, uh, with that inner core of five best friends uh, across uh, different media. So uh, it's the same friends using different media as it were, face-to-face, -face, Skype, phone, instant messaging, texting, or email and SNS. We didn't differentiate those two. Um, but you can see that Face-to-face -face and Skype produce much, much more satisfactory relationships. There's two reasons for that, I think. One is there's a sense of immediacy. You feel like you're in the room together on Skype in a way which you don't with these other uh, uh, digital media. And secondly, you can see the reaction to what you say breaking on the face of the person as it happens. And you just don't get those kind of cues uh, from non-visual media. So it seems that that visual uh, component is really very important. And the core to it, we think, lies in laughter. That if you look at the occurrence of laughter, whether it's real laughter or in the case of written media, uh, uh, like email and so on, uh, 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 emoticons or LOLs or any of those kind of things, um, you get much, much more laughter going on in face-to-face -face and Skype, of course, and to a lesser extent on the phone. But the big difference, and this applies across all these media, is if you get laughter, in the interaction, you come away from it with a much warmer sense of that interaction than if you don't get laughter. And we've been able to show that laughter is a very good producer of endorphin surges. This is why when you go to a stand-up comedy show, uh, you know, literally you go in and you're kind of, well, you know, old British folk are sort of sitting looking at people on either side of them and not talking to them. But when you come out after doing a lot of laughter, when you come out in the vestibule, you're telling your life story to complete strangers. It's that sense that, you know, all's well with the world and this is wonderful and, uh, you know, I love you. Uh, <coughs> and here's the data to show that. So this is, this is using pain tolerance as an assay for endorphins. Uh, these are six, five different experiments, one of which was done live at the Edinburgh Fringe Festival on comedy uh, uh, performances. So these guys are watching comedy in some form, either on video or live. These guys are watching boring things like golfing instruction videos. And this is the relative pain tolerance change. So here's zero. All these, if you laugh, you get this surge of endorphins which raises your pain threshold from this little opiate high you get. If you do boring stuff, uh, it doesn't have any effect or, 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 or not. Thank you very much. I'm told you can have three minutes for questions. <laughs> any questions? Sam, you must have a question. Got the mic as well. one over there. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Farhan Rahman from Conscious Comms. Um, I'm just wondering about brain plasticity. 
um, and how if children that have been brought up with social networks that allows them to build relationships in a way that physically you can only have so many relationships and contact, but virtually you can potentially extend that reach. What's your opinion of how that might impact the development of their brains and kind of their ability to have more capacity than we have, say, right. not had that? Yep. Um, uh, I think the answer is hinges around the question of whether you can build a relationship virtually or not. That's to say a real relationship. Uh, our worry is, on the basis of what we see, is that what Facebook doesn't, oh, Facebook et al, do and do very well is allow you to keep contact with friends who in the normal course of the old world you would have lost contact with, right? So it allows you to hold those relationships up. The question is, does it allow you to form real relationships uh, in the absence of getting together face to face? And the other half of our uh, research, if you like, really emphasizes the need to be sitting in front of that person and, and, you know, sort of actually banging heads together, if you like. The question is, can you, you know, Skype is an unexplored and it's, the technology is getting so much better. The question is, you know, can, you know, virtual uh, interactions of that kind replace that or do you really have to grapple with people? Uh, and that may then be a function of inner core relationships need you know, physical contact, maybe you can have weaker relationships with, with people in the outer circles, perhaps. But the other question then is, if it's the case that you really need to grapple face-to-face -to -face with people to experience, well, really to learn the social skills, and this is what the brain element is probably all about, learn the social skills for handling them, and particularly for handling conflicts, for resolving conflicts and negotiating that maybe you can only do that face-to-face. -face. And if you're spending a lot of time online, as kids are, you know, if, if somebody insults you, you can pull the plug on them. In the sand pit, you can't. You've got to sort it out there. So you're forced to actually grapple with these problems. So this is unknown territory, and of course we, you know, the, these kind of sns -E type things have only been going around on for you know, seven or eight years, so we don't know what the long-term consequences are yet. Uh, we don't really even have a good sense of, of, of what the future might hold. But I think there are issues to worry about it with kids anyway in terms of lack of... You know, if they're spending a lot of time on, online, they're not going out there beating the shit out of each other. <laughs> Very interesting in the, the difference or the impact of different sorts of media on the interactions and, and you know, what you see with Skype and video and rich interactions. Do you think as social networks develop and start to make more use of video, the fact that you know, people have more and more yep. got video enabled phones, what impact do you think that will have, if any, or is that still, there's still going to be a fundamental limit to that? I think, I, I mean, I think as, as the media get richer, in these terms, and the real one I'm waiting for somebody to solve, I keep offering it, is virtual touch. Um, <laughs> uh, if somebody can solve that, they'll probably get the Nobel Peace Prize. <laughs> but um, as the media get richer, it, you know, people are going to make more use of them, obviously, and, and you, you know, it's a kind of mobile thing, and so you can, you can keep contact. The question is, you know, what are your core real relationships that you want to keep turning over that regularly? Do you, do you really want to be contacting your second cousins twice removed? Or, you know, the people that you meet up, you know, once a year perhaps, or, or, or just send a Christmas card to, um, that often, you know, is our social world really so small scale that it's built around this inner core of maybe 15 to 20, you know, really important people that you know, sort of provide us with the resources that we really need, the emotional resources in terms of our everyday relationships and so on. Um, and the rest, you know, it's, they're important in a more, much more general sense that doesn't require us to interact that often with them. You know, they're the people, uh, in the last session I overheard them mentioning Granovetta stuff, the, the weak and strong link stuff. You know, your weak links out in the outer periphery is who you find, you know, information about jobs from and those kind of things. We just may not need to be talking to these guys every day. And my suspicion is that or even though there is undoubtedly a learning process and the brain is much more plastic than we ever believed, and so you know, early social experience may lead you to have a bigger kind of uh, orbital frontal cortex and therefore handle more people, this stuff settles down. And probably by your mid-20s, 
there's nothing more you can do. <laughs> you are stuck with whatever you've got with at that point. And therefore, having, however rich the media are uh, in communication terms, it actually isn't going to affect what you can do with it. You know, there is literally a human limitation at that point. Okay. Right. Thank you very much, Robin. Great, so that's pretty, pretty amazing actually. How many people are in a relationship right now? Hands up. It's a lot of lost friends there, I can see from the, uh, from the numbers there. So um, that was amazing, Robin, thank you very much. So next up we have some Googlers. We have um, Ian Carrington, who's Director of Mobile and Social for um, Northern and Central Europe. Um, and Ian's going to take you through the proposition of Google+. Plus. So talk, th talk you through um, the big idea about how that works. And then we're going to have Beth Foster coming on board is going to be doing a demo of how it works. And Beth is a Google product specialist for Google Plus product specialist for UK and Ireland. So without further ado, Ian Carrington. Thanks. Hi, everyone. Um, my name's Ian Carrington, as uh, Paul just said. Uh, I'm really, really very lucky, not because of the echo, uh, that I get to work on Google Plus and mobile. Um, I've been at Google for about nine years now, and I used to work in the finance vertical, which is not particularly interesting. And about two years ago, I set up the, the, the mobile um, sales team. And it was a facet fascinating journey, because mobile and social are really going to be the growth engines for digital going forwards. When I set up the mobile sales team two years ago, about two or three percent of queries from things like travel and retail and uh, entertainment were coming through from mobile. Today, it's 15 percent. Next year, it's going to be 25, 30 percent. <coughs> And we're also seeing the same kind of growth coming from social at Google as, as well now. And um, we've already got 90 million G Plus users, uh, um, and we only launched the product a few months ago. And already we have these uh, on the Google Plus button. We have over 5 billion uh, daily impressions uh, happening every day as well. So again, it just shows you the kind of fantastic growth that we saw in mobile. It's going to be happening on social very, very quickly. Now, a lot of you may be thinking about what is a Google Plus button. Uh, I'm sure many of you here today don't actually have a Google Plus account, and I'm just going to ask that question. So put your hand up if you've got a Google Plus account. Oh, fantastic. Thank you all very much. <laughs> that is great news. Um, <laughs> we'll come on to that later. <laughs> so um, um, you, many of you, will, in that case, will know what a Google Plus button is. Um, many of you may not know why we're doing that. And essentially why we're putting these Google Plus buttons onto search results is because we want to make our search engine and all of our products a lot more personal to you. We want to make it very, very tailored to your experiences and give you the results that you want. Now, a few years ago, if you typed in a search onto Google, you'd get exactly the same result as the person next to you in the audience today. And you're, everyone in this audience is unique. You've got different backgrounds, different education, different friends, different family, different social circumstances. And why should you get the same results all the time? We just don't think that's relevant. Um, for me, I'm, um, I'm married. I'm 39 years old. I've got a, a little baby boy who's uh, 22 months old. And when I used to type in holiday onto Google, I wanted to go to Thailand or to the Caribbean or something like that. Now I just want to go on holiday with someone with crash facilities uh, so me and my wife can get a bit of peace and quiet and uh, get some sleep. But the results, you know, if it's not tailored, they're going to be exactly the same. But we want different things from our search engine. And it's not just search that we're working on as well. It's all of the Google products, whether it be Maps, YouTube, or anything. So that's a little bit about Google and social. And I just want to kind of take you through the value proposition, as Paul said. The first thing is that we don't see social as a destination. We don't see it as somewhere that you go to. We, something, we see it as something that is intertwined in, uh, in your everyday experience when using Google pro products. We don't think it's something you should go to and just find out information from your friends and uh, uh, family. Whenever you're doing a search, you want to hear from your friends and family. You want to hear from the influencers in your group. And that's what we're trying to do uh, with Google Plus today. So why are we doing this? Um, if you look at some of the trends, they're absolutely fascinating. The first one we want to share with you is that one in uh, uh, five minutes spent on digital is now done on social, uh, which is very, very impressive. The second biggest activity is YouTube and, and watching videos. Um, we also think it's mass market now as well. Um, I know this is a, a bit of a silly question, but the second question makes sense. Uh, put your hand up if you've got a social media account. That's not everyone. I'm surprised by that. Um, put your hand up if your mum or your dad have got a social media account. Okay, so it's about 70% of the room. 
that gives you an idea of how mass market it is today. But it also comes onto a few of the problems that every person has different sides to their personality. And many kind of social networks today, you just project the same personality, whether it's to your mum, your friends, or your colleagues. And that's something that we don't think is necessarily correct, correct at Google, uh, because it is such a mass market proposition now as well. Um, obviously, my other passion as well as social is, is mobile. And we see that 45% of, of, of social usage is now coming through from a mobile phone. That's no real surprise to people when you think about things like Twitter or Foursquare, where you're checking in and you want to give people updates about where you are at any one time. The mobile phone is the perfect opportunity to do that. And we see a lot of people using their mobile phone uh, at work uh, to actually connect to uh, social networks. Obviously, if you're not using your mobile phone, you are using your desktop, uh, even though some companies uh, do try and ban it. I know I banned it from my sales team uh, about three years ago about people going to Facebook until I actually saw that one person in my sales team got an order from this person they knew at an agency via Facebook. So I thought, OK, it's OK to use Facebook at work. <laughs> so what are people doing? Well, I couldn't remember these stats myself, so uh, I printed them off because I'm still quite new to social. I only set the team up uh, about 45 days ago. But people are doing absolutely everything on social. 62% of us are posting status updates. 74% are reading posts uh, from people they know personally. 42% of us are following celebrities or well-known people and getting updates from them. 45% of, um, of us are reading posts from organizations or businesses that we like. And 27% of us are receiving coupons uh, via email or other factors as well. And 24% of us, and I find this stat fascinating, are getting out our smartphones in a shop or a retail outlet and checking customer reviews to make sure that is the product they want to purchase. So social has a real, real impact on people's lives, both socially but also commercially, in terms of people are trusting what their friends and family are saying before they make that purchase. This stat amazed me when I presented it about two weeks ago. Um, I was really surprised that more people speak to their friends online than they do in real life. And I think that's a little bit scary uh, when we think about it. I'm really worried about my two-year-old son. Uh, um, he, his, the first three words he learned were mum, dad, and iPad. Uh, and I just think he's going to be connected the whole time, all his life, and I really hope he, de he develops the kind of conversation skills you need to be successful in life, because so many people are just doing it through the internet today. So out of the social networks that we, that we see there, uh, out there today, uh, we see a few things that we think we could be doing better in the social networking space. Uh, the first thing we see is that messages are impersonal. Often they're not tailored. As we heard from Robin earlier, we just post something. We think we're speaking to five people, possibly 15 people. But the reality is we're speaking to absolutely everyone on our social network. So they're very impersonal. They're not tailored. We also see that um, the comments are not conversations. It's a one-way thing. And then maybe it's a comment you know, a few minutes later, a few hours later, a few days later. But it's not a conversation. It's just a comment that is happening uh, at that moment in time. We find that recommendations like staying power. If someone says they like a book or a film. Great, you know, you don't always remember it, but then that post is lost. If you come to looking for a book or a film in three months' time, you can't remember exactly what your friend said. So we think that's a really important part, 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 point about getting that staying power. And we also think that market, marketing is fragmented uh, as well, that it's not cohesive. So what are we doing about it? Well, we've launched Google+. Plus. Uh, again, I'm going to talk about the value proposition, but Beth's going to do the demonstrations uh, around Google+, Plus uh, straight after me. So the first thing that we've done is circles. We want to make sure that messages are tailored, they are personal, they are relevant to people. And a quick example uh, of how this works uh, is on Google Circles is these three things here. I um, go to Mountain View where our head office is rel relatively often. And uh, when I come back from my trip, uh, there's maybe three different types of people, my wife, uh, my friends, and, and my boss. Uh, who asked me how my trip was. So when my wife asked me, obviously it was about catching up with that old friend that we both used to know in London, and we had a really nice dinner in San Francisco. Uh, with my friends, it's maybe about going out to a, to a nightclub uh, and having a few too many cocktails. And when it's my boss, it's very much about that excellent presentation I did, or that fantastic piece of research that I had commissioned. So you can see here that I've got different sides to my personality that I want to reflect in different ways. And we think circles is essential to doing that. Another example about how businesses can use this. Um, I used to work in the finance sector, as I said. You know, as a bank, you can't just communicate to everyone in exactly the same uh, uh, way. Here, you've got people who are generally a little bit older, um, and they're looking for a retirement plan. You put them in a circle there around retirement plans. 
for people who are generally a little bit younger and are looking for their first property, you put them in a different circle. And both times you'd have a different message conveying to them, a different value proposition, a different side of that brand that you represent communicating to these different people. So what if, a conversation, what if the kind of posts you had were real conversations? But it was very interesting what Robin was saying about Skype, about how when you're visually connecting with people, it makes such a difference. Well, we've actually got a piece of functionality called Google Hangouts, um, which allows you to actually have a visual conversation uh, with someone there. And this is something we did with David Beckham uh, in H&M uh, a few weeks ago in our Mountain View office. And essentially, you have lots and lots of people, uh, as you can see along the bottom there, having a chat with David, asking him, why you look so great in a pair of pants, I guess. <laughs> uh, uh, and also about the brand, and, and, and it's a really engaging way for brands to connect with their consumers and when it's in real time and it's visual and it's happening there. So we think that's a really important point about um, uh, 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 Hangouts. The plus one button, I mentioned it earlier already. We think this is really, really important. We think you know, it's really essential that you uh, uh, surface recommendations from friends. There's some research that I've seen here um, that says that you're 3% more likely to buy something when it's a referral from a friend. I actually heard a stat from social media work a couple of, weeks ago, uh, a couple of days ago saying it was actually 1,000% more likely to buy something when it's a personal recommendation to you from your friend. Whatever the stat is, I think we all know that if one of our friends says we like something, we're really keen to actually give it a go and to potentially buy that. So we think that plus one button that stays there the whole time is really important. An example here is if you're looking for a phone, you get the typical search results coming through from Google here. But what we're doing with the plus button is you actually get a much more tailored message. You can actually have your friends actually recommending to you here, saying, yes, we like this phone shop, or yes, we like this phone, or yes, we like this product or service that your brand represents. So we think plus one buttons are really going to drive um, sales because recommendations really count. And then we also think it's really important for, uh, for businesses to connect with their customers, not just via Hangouts, not just via plus buttons and the other things that we're doing, but to actually create a Google Plus page uh, as well. Here's one from the Android team. I work very, very closely with them. They put this page up there. They update it with uh, comments and, uh, and thoughts uh, from the people who work in the Android team. They post cool videos on there so people can really engage with the Android brand. Here's one from uh, Valentine's Day where you have the two little uh, androids uh, uh, going on a date together, which is very cute and appealed to a lot of people. But whatever your brand is, you can, you can put the relevant content on there and tailor it to your audience. So we think it's really important um, um, to really be connecting with perhaps what we count as the world's biggest uh, uh, audience. I think we've got over a billion people connected across all of our different products now. And we think you know, Google, is going to, Google Plus is going to be intertwined and permeate every single one of those products uh, that we have. So how can you today get started? Well, there's three points we, we advise you to do. The first one is create a page um, and link it to your site uh, and update it with cool information. Uh, the second one is start yeah, you know, putting valuable content out there via Hangouts. Start really engaging, in, 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 engaging uh, users often in a medium they like. You know, social, people who are on social networks are often more responsive to advertising. And the third one is promote your, uh, promote your page and start driving people to it so you can really start capturing them and communicating to them on a way that they like. So I know that was a little bit fast and we had to make time because Beth is actually going to show you how all this works in real time. So uh, thank you all very much and I'll hand you over to Beth now. Okay, so I'm going to switch over to um, Google Plus itself. Um, now, I'm a little disappointed that you all use it already. I know I should be pleased, but this is, might be boring for you. Um, you might be really familiar with what we're about to do, but I just want to walk you through the platform, how to do things, how to set your profile up, and uh, how you can get the most out of Google Plus. So, um, if we start where I think 81% of people start when they start an online journey, Google.com. So search, oh, search is still really important. So we were just talking about David Beckham. Let's try a uh, Beckham Hangout. Now you can see here, you could if I was on the right mm -hmm. system, that uh, there's people immediately, I can see they're recommending this. So David Beckham, who is in my social circles, best friends, um, <laughs> He has uh, recommended that one, so I automatically know that's the video I want to watch. And then underneath that, Vic Gundotra, who's the product manager for Google+, Plus, sorry, 
uh, has recommended that other video. So that's telling me something immediately. But again, how do I know that that's the right person that I trust? How do, I, how do we identify people online? Well, that would be your Google Plus profile. So switching back, I can then look at David's profile, or I can look at my own. Mine is far more interesting, so let's look at mine. Uh, there's my picture. And then here is everything that I am sharing. <laughs> you can see I was, I was using the Wi-Fi. I shouldn't have been. But um, everything that I have created and shared on Google+. Now, obviously, you wouldn't normally be seeing this because I wouldn't normally project everything I do. This is stuff that I have shared with everybody. And it might be public, uh, which is that one, or there's actual Valentine's message, <laughs> which I'm going to show you embarrassingly. Uh, with my boyfriend here was limited and it was just me and him and it was a guitar pick that I gave him. So um, it depends who you're sharing with and everything that you do share, you're choosing who to share that with in the circles and content is curated by you for the people that you want to share it with. It's not going out en masse. So taking an example, um, let's look at photos. So here we go over to my photos section and I'm going to go to photos from my phone. Ah, hasn't quite uploaded yet. The Wi-Fi is quite slow. Here's one we did earlier. So we do have a feature that I'll show you in a minute, but right now I want to share this photo with a certain group. So I'm clicking on that photo. First of all, actually, I just want to show you the creative toolkit because this is very fun. Um, you can add all kinds of annotations and <laughs> it's too slow. I'm going to give up on that. Sorry. We're tethering right now of 3G, so um, that was the Wi-Fi problems we had earlier. I'm going to go back. Now, imagine I wanted to share that. Now, who's actually interested in that? It's probably only people in my kind of tech circles. So I have tech friends and I have tech pros. <laughs> I have a lot of circles because it's my job, but you wouldn't necessarily have so many. And I would give it a nice hashtag. Um, and it's coming up there because it's a hashtag that has already been used by enough people that it's auto-populating. So that's a really great feature about Google+, Plus, is you're not going to use the wrong hashtag and create millions of hashtags around one issue. It does auto-populate with the, with the right ones. That's very handy. Then I would click Share. Now that's going to go in my stream. So now I'm going to show you my stream here, which is everybody I'm following um, from all the different circles. But we understand that you often get a lot of noise in your social network, so it's much easier to read things by stream. So family is obviously really important. <laughs> There's my mum in 1969. So I'm going to turn the volume up on that one because I never want to miss anything from my family. That's really important to me. Acquaintances are people that have added me. I don't really know who they are, um, so I'm going to turn that one down a little bit because I don't want that in my mainstream, but sometimes I do want to read that one. So where do all these, these lists come from? They're my circles, so I'm going to switch back over here to circles. Now, you've probably seen this. These are people I haven't added yet on Google+, and these are my circles, and I have a lot of them. So you can see I've got respectful, and then I've got edgy banter here. <laughs> There's a lot of different messages you want to share. So I have my friend Claire, who I'm going to drag into friends. She's not quite using Google+, yet. Um, if I wanted to delete a circle, let's see one that doesn't have too many people in it. Let's try this one. I'm going to click on that. And I don't need that anymore. So let's roll that one away. <laughs> Very nice. So we built Google Plus to enable you to share things with the right people at the right time and the right content. So I'm going to see how that works in practice. Let's look at. Mashable. I know that's one of the great sources oh, sorry. of information for most people in this room. And again, I'm just going to switch. My computer doesn't like it. It gets confused at where it's based. Now, I can see here Pete Cashmore is in my circles. So I'm going to plus one Mashable because it's something I really trust and I endorse. And so that when people come to Google and they see that I've endorsed that, they know if they trust me that it's trustworthy. If they don't trust me and they see my plus one, it's still a valuable piece of information to them because then they'll ignore it and carry on looking further down. So when we click on Mashable, my plus one should have been carried over. It's, oh, there it is. Yep. So it's been carried over from the search results and it's now blue. So that's a really interesting piece of technology, that when you plus one something on search, 
it syncs with the website and it adds to that count there. So 53,000 people have plus one that. They also have a button up here where I can add them to circles. So if I'm just going to click that there, I'm going to say, I actually want to hear from Mashable as often as um, they want to share with me. So I'm going to put that in tech pros and then I'm going to go over to Mashable to the Google Plus page that they have. And you'll see, again, we've come full circle, and the plus one button is blue again there. So what that tells us is that I've endorsed it in one place, but it's spread out across the web. So it's given this social layer on top of everything that you already do. If someone is endorsing you on search, they're also endorsing your page and your website. And that works in, uh, the other way around as well, and it works with ads. So if the, you had a display ad and you had a plus one button on there, which appears automatically on the Google Display Network, your plus one would appear there as well. So we're not trying to create a destination, as Ian says. We're trying to create a social layer on everything you already do to make it much more powerful. And I think what Robin was saying earlier about um, your friendship groups is really, really interesting. So even though we might only be able to have 150, perhaps with Google+, Plus, you can find people um, who are relevant to your interests or they are people that you wouldn't have necessarily met otherwise, but are just the right people you want to be friends with. Now, it might mean you have to lose a few from that 150, but if you can find new friends, um, this might be the way to do it. So can someone tell me something that, um, someone on the front row, what's one of your interests in, in, in life? Who would you want to talk to and about what that you don't already know? It's maybe photography or art or anybody? What, someone must have a hobby. <laughs> no, just social media. Model trains, Model trains thank you. <laughs> oh, okay. We've got a few results already. So I'm searching in the top here, and I've got everything from everyone, everywhere. Now there's a page, so we can look at that, the amazing world of trains. This might be someone I want to talk to and add to circles. So I've now gone to 151 friends, <laughs> but they might be just the right people. So this is a page just like a business page, I can plus one it, I can add it to my circles, and then they can add me back, and it will give me all the information I need. If I wanted to see what the latest chat was about model trains, I could look just in Google Plus posts, and you can see the power of search we've brought through from Google onto Google Plus, and it tells, don't know how that's related to model trains. <laughs> this, I don't want to say how powerful Google is. It knows my interest, because that, that's not my interest. But it should give you results based on your existing interests. So um, here we go. A lot of results. So you might think that you've heard rumors that Google Plus is uh, not being used, or it's dead, or you know all these other stats. But 80% of um, people on Google Plus interact with it on a weekly basis. 60% interact daily. Um, and I don't think those numbers are. Uh, anything, you know, they're only going to grow uh, from what we've seen, and we've got 90 million people using it. Uh, I think that was about a month ago, and three months before that, it was 40 million, so we've, we're seeing exceptional growth rates. So we've looked at search there, we've looked at circles. This is the games tab, so of course we had to have games, um, which are really popular. I'm not going to dwell on that because I'm not interested in it, <laughs> and that's what counts right now. So, um, <laughs> I'm going to show you a couple of more things. So what's hot? This is a bit like uh, trending topics on Twitter, but it tells us the, the most interesting posts at any time. So Larry Page is one of our, um, our CEO, in fact, and his post apparently is what's hot because it has nearly 2,000 people plus wanting it and nearly 1,000 people sharing it, and that's about exercise. So you can imagine when he posts about something, um, even with the naked women, perhaps that might, might, might do better. But let's see actually how well that is doing by clicking on View Ripples. So we can see, because it's a public post and he's chosen to share it publicly, that it's spread virally. Mm -hmm. And we can see the timing of that as well. So that was between 6.54 a.m. and 3.43 a.m. It's already spread that much. Now imagine the power of that for your brand. If you can zoom in and you can see how something is being shared virally, that's incredibly powerful information. And you can see exactly the posts that they wrote along with that reshare. Now obviously we're not gonna share this when it's private information or it's shared with circles or one person in particular. But when it's publicly shared, this is information that's on the web and they uh, are choosing to share it publicly. So 
we've put together this tool called Ripples. And a little more data at the bottom is the key influences. So apart from Larry, uh, Kevin and Elena and those other guys are the most important people. So I think we've seen that with a couple of brands, and Cadbury might tell you about this when they talk later. Um, you can identify your biggest brand advocates, the most passionate people about your brand with this tool and, and who is sharing the most. And you can see there as well the languages it's shared in. So Portuguese is the second, which is interesting. But then Brazil is one of the most active places for social media. So the most exciting thing, and I think this echoes what Robin is saying about face-to-face, -face, is that we understand that face-to-face -face contact is the best way to engage with people. And this can be your friends that currently exist, or it can be new people that you need to meet. So Laurie Ruff, I have no idea who she is. She's um, someone in one of my tech pro circles. I don't know her, but I'm really interested in this post. I could then hang out directly on that post. I'll hang out on this one instead and talk to the person who's created that post and anyone else who is able to see that post. So that one might be, who's that shared with? It's public. But if it was shared with a limited group, I would be able to talk with that whole limited group or the public about that post. And you can see there, there's a hangout. So I'm going to start a hangout from scratch. So it's not about a particular post. And I'm going to make it public. And let's see who joins us. This is risky, very risky. <laughs> So <laughs> I could do this um, in a different way. I could invite one person in particular, and I could have a face-to-face -face chat with my manager who's on a business trip in San Francisco, or my best friend who's just moved to Paris. I could have a uh, hangout with a circle, so my team. I could have a shared uh, conversation with them. Or I could do a public hangout, which we see as kind of Back in the day, maybe you'd sit on your porch. There we have Jerry. Jerry's joined me from there. <laughs> Thanks, Jerry. I'm not alone in the world. <laughs> but um, <laughs> that's quite funny. Thank you. So what I was saying, back in the day, we might sit on our porch or we would um, sit, uh, where, where else might you sit? Somewhere publicly where you want people to come by and chat with you. Here we go, Paddy in the office. Hi, Paddy. Hi, Paddy. Hi, uh. <laughs> How's work? Sorry? How's work? It's brilliant. Yeah. I'm loving it. <laughs> Dahlia, how's work for you? <laughs> Fine. It's great. Thanks, <laughs> Where are you? Um, at my desk. At your desk. <laughs> well, you have about 100 people now. Who they, they're all thinking you, you look great. That's the first thing we want to say. <laughs> you look tired. Have you had a tough day? <laughs> really tough. Yeah, really tough. Thanks so much, Beth. I'm really glad you're doing this. And Lucy as well. These people, I've just, uh, they're my friends. That's what it is. They've come on to help me. Hi, Lucy. <laughs> How are you doing? I joined in a bit late. <laughs> That's all right. And Amanda, Amanda, where are you? I'm in, uh, I'm in California, so I, I coun't hear you over all the time. Where, are you driving? <laughs> 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 Sorry, Hello. Amanda, can you show us who's driving? Because I really hope you're not driving. So someone is driving. I, I can't actually show you who they are right now. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> <laughs> and Harry, Harry is my boss. Hi, Harry. Where, Hi there. You're not at work. How are you? <laughs> I'm good. Where are you? I'm, I'm at home. I'm, uh, I'm at home looking after this fellow. Oh, oh, look at your dog. Oh. He's, a, he's an eight-week-old cockapoo <laughs> and uh, it's fresh. Well, he's so gorgeous. He's better than being at the social media, media week. <laughs> thing. The first dog on a hangout. <clears throat> A live hangout, anyway, a demo. And who, who else? Who's this? <laughs> hey, this might be something I don't. This, I was open publicly. <laughs> Amanda, can you show us the view if you really are in California? I am in California. I'm actually at the offices, the uh, Mountain View offices where I work. So let's go outside. <laughs> Thank this you, Annika. Is, uh, the view. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's pretty pretty depressing. We might I might block you now. 
<laughs> it's pretty much a, a business park, yeah. Mm-hmm. So you're on your phone? Yes, I am on my phone. We're, we're doing all of this off 3G tethering. I think that's pretty incredible. We've got 10 people on a hangout from all over the world. So sorry about the quality, everybody. The Wi-Fi is not working here. Okay, I think we've... Were we done with this? <laughs> yeah, I think we're done. Okay, bye, Google. Bye, friends. Bye. bye. <laughs> Dalia, Dalia, can you wait? Harry, Harry. Harry, can yeah. you wait one second? Can you just show me what you're working on? I just want to do a screen share. <laughs> That's what I thought. <laughs> no? <laughs> could, you, could you share your screen with me? Harry? Me? Are you doing that now? Yeah. Kevin, my boss is boss. This is getting even more interesting. <laughs> Kevin, could you show me your screen? Oh, no, Harry showed me his. Okay. Doesn't look like work. Hello. Hi, no, hi Kevin. This is, um, this is a, uh, um, a answer. To, I'm doing a master's in um, mechanical engineering, and so I've been working on, on this today. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I, th- I, I suspect that nice most of the social media week conference needs to understand how patent law has <laughs> changed the um, content of lead free solders. <laughs> no, but if I did know anything, I'd love to. I just heard to... myself speak on someone else's phone. It's horrific. We've someone sharing, someone sharing a map Who's with us that? as well. This is getting, getting very interesting. So if, if I wanted to, I could yeah, work I'm... on a document. Sorry, whoever you are. I'm mapping all my followers on Google Plus so I can plan to take over the world. <laughs> That's quite cool. Let's see who this is. Robert Anderson. Do I know you? <laughs> Hi, Robert. Yeah, I'm on Google Plus. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, great to meet you. <laughs> nice to meet you. Kevin, you're buying ski goggles. So neither of my bosses are working. Yeah. Okay. Just. Uh, clarify that. I, I'm having a busy day today. Uh, it was very cold last weekend and I need some new goggles for different okay. light. Okay. Well, I recommend, I hear an orange tint is good. So um, the bottom row uh, might be the best. I am also I technically on holiday. <laughs> <laughs> so actually, I should be getting overtime for coming to the conference. <laughs> we'll make sure we sort that out. And, I, and luckily, Kevin's on the hangout, so he can, he can authorise that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah with, with your skiing goggles. <laughs> and you're which, not on holiday. <laughs> which, yeah, I was just going to say, technically, technically I'm working, which is slightly ironic, isn't it? I was thinking the, uh, these ones with the iridium red lens <laughs> look pretty good to match my, uh, match my goggles, but... Is Does the, anyone uh, in the room know anything the... about ski goggles? Want to shout out? <laughs> no report. Being hey, crowdsourcing um, here. That's, that's great, Kevin. But Robert, what's going on in the background of your room? It looks fascinating. Is that a wheel? Oh, uh, yeah, that's from a J109. That's one of the race boats that I race on a sailboat. It's like actually wow. a prototype wheel that the back rebuilt for us. Yeah. Okay. You're in sailboats. <laughs> I'm going to drop out. I'm going to drop out, but you guys carry on. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thanks, everybody. That's so much cooler than anything we've been talking okay. about. All right. <laughs> okay. Thanks, everybody. So hopefully you can see how well that works with... Um, with 3G, and if you had your own Wi-Fi at home, it would be even clearer. But I think that really emphasizes the power of face-to-face conversation and how it can bring people together around any topic, um, anywhere on the web. So I'm just going to show you one final thing before I hand back is uh, how to create a Google Plus page. So we won't go through the steps, but you simply, once you've set up your profile, which is with your own email address, you can then create a page for your business or your brand here. Um, And we're going to hear from Cadbury how they've done that with enormous success and how they're set to reach a million followers, I believe, in the next uh, next month, Jerry? For a little while longer than that. Um, 
I have a prize, I didn't bring it with me, but it's outside, for the person who can tell me um, the biggest page on Google Plus right now. Does anyone know? No. 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 Not Facebook. No. Britney Spears would be, but it's the, she's the biggest profile. So that's personal profile. The page, actually, the clue is right here. It's H&M. Oh. <laughs> so that's the biggest brand. The biggest brand. The actual page, sorry, is Coldplay. But the biggest brand online is H&M. So definitely check out what they're doing. And I would also recommend um, looking at Burberry, um, who posts fantastic content every day. Um, and the New York Times as well are fantastic. Um, there's a lot we can talk about if we had more time that, of people that are doing really well. But um, the New York Times, they post questions, so they might say, what kind of content do you want to see? And it's absolutely fascinating, the responses they get. And they would have hangouts as well around different posts. So uh, they did a crowdsourcing question around identifying a, a bomb that a journalist had found, and they got an answer very quickly. And I think the, the level of conversation is there on Google Plus already, and you can see that with all these different brands. So I'm just going to leave you now with um, another hangout that we had, which was the Black Eyed Peas, and then a uh, hand over. Yeah? Okay. Should be there. So our hangout works better than YouTube. Yo. Yeah, yeah, we live up in this What up? Yeah. 60,000 people, Central Park, free show for Robin Hood. Yo, Brendan, where you at? I just talked to Will I Am. He, he said my name. What up, Peter? Right, have you thought how you're going to integrate this into like any of your live shows? We're doing that right now on stage. 60,000 people out there in the audience. See that, that camera right here with homeboy right there holding up his hat? Oh, yeah. That's the stage that we're, I'm about to walk to. Awesome. Wow. All right, Great. we'll see you guys later. Stay in the hangout. Right now, we are live on my G Plus page. Don't be sipping, don't trick up. I'm be shaking my hips. You gon' be licking your lips. I'm gonna be taking her. It's like the new MTV. We start making this more entertaining and interactive and engaging and making content around this. It's not behind music. This is going to be the music. 2000 and next. <laughs> everybody in cyberspace, meet everybody in New York City right about now. And if you got a cell phone, let's light up the night right now. Let's light up tonight right now. Put your phone in now. Hey, if you love who you are, we gonna light up tonight right now. Touch the screen, cause right now we can so make had the, the computer on the screen, the screen, the whole concert, on the stage, so. Is this his first concert? Yeah. <laughs> awesome. We got Will I Am back. Oh, awesome. Get hey, Amanda. Yo, know, what's up? Hey. 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 Thanks for, uh, for staying on with us. Uh, we had a great time. Um, can't wait to see you guys again at another uh, concert. We love you, thank you, we are the Okay. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. Didn't come. I thought the instant upload might work, but with normal um, connections, you'd see the photo. Great, that was awesome. Thank you very much for that. Um, okay, next we have Alex, who's yes. come on stage right, um, which is fantastic. Alex uh, Bentley, professor, another professor from um, University of Bristol of Anthropology and Archaeology. Uh, he specializes in quantitative models for popular cultural change. Um, he most recently uh, co-authored a book uh, called I'll Have What She's Having. It's all about how groups um, imp impact on personal decision making. So, Alex Bentley. Thank you. And um, in just watching from the side here, I was struck by two things. Um, the first was the, the fact that H&M was the biggest site at the moment. And that, uh, that reinforces for me the, the unpredictability of success 
when a new uh, when a new opportunity like this or a new genre opens up. And anthropology is a very it's a it's a great subject for uh, seeing the long term patterns of success <laughs> over time, and really reaffirming how difficult it is to actually predict that. And the other thing was, um, on my way here, I had trouble, I had trouble uh, finding my way here. And uh, I was on a street just half a block south of Bow Street. And I asked somebody who, who worked in a building there. Um, he was outside having a fag on his work break. And I said, where is Bow Street? And he said he had no idea. And he looked like he'd been working there for 10 years. Um, no offense to him, but um, I, uh, and, and that for me, again, reinforces this radical new world that we live in where we are, are very localized in, in our knowledge about our space but simultaneously having global reach and what we can, what we can attain. And the same may be true, you may find in your, own, uh, in your own kind of ethnographic studies that the same often feels true of the social world. Um, we can be blissfully ignorant of people um, very close to us uh, as we maintain connections so far afield. And that really is very different. Um, and one of the things I want to emphasize today, because I knew I was going to follow Robin's talk, was really just how social we are by nature. And so I know he will have covered this, and, and you can see below there a, um, a graph that, uh, that uh, he published in Science a few years ago. Um, about uh, his well-known research on the, the, the nature of the social brain. And there have been other kinds of neurological studies, uh, like up in the upper right, that's a bit blurry, but it's meant there to show how the very centers that, evo that, uh, that trigger pain and pleasure in our brains also trigger social reward and uh, rejection. And uh, just, the, just to, to note here that uh, even economists nowadays are very much tuning in to the fact that we get our, our ideas from other people. Now that doesn't seem, probably doesn't seem uh, radical to a crowd like this, but it is radical in the context of 150 years of economics. And the thing is, the reason why I brought up that, uh, that example about being on the street corner is that um, it, it is really rather remarkable for people to be ignorant of, of their space. So prehistoric groups would reinforce their knowledge of space uh, through narratives and folklore. The, the um, Australian Aborigines are very famous for doing so and having detailed maps of their, uh, of their terrain uh, embedded in their own cultural systems. And for most of our time on this earth as, as human beings, we have lived within kinship systems that dictate often very strongly how we approach one another, whom we can marry, how, how we even address each other. And this is, a, um, this is from the Kung San here in, in Africa from a famous study in the 50s just showing the red, tri the triangles are males and the, and the circles are females. But this is indicating how um, somebody in blue here with another generation could have a joking, uh, a, re an avoid a, a relationship where they uh, avoid each other and others, and others when you're working with the, uh, the adjacent generation, you would have relationships where you're, you're uh, encouraged to joke with one another. So actually the, 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 the nature of social relations for most of our, uh, our species existence on this earth has been very tightly regulated by the kinship societies systems in which we live but those all varied uh, it's not that we don't have a uh, we don't have a sort of uh, bow plan if you will of how we're supposed to interact with our kin but we often live in cultures we have lived in cultures as a species where there was a bow plan that evolved over time and to, uh, into which we were born and of course now, this is such a fascinating transition because young people now are, bo are born into um, a very, very different uh, social network. Um, and that, that up in the upper right was just to show a paper that I, um, we, Robin and I did with Russ Hill uh, on, on some of these regularities and the hierarchies of social organization, even in baboons. So uh, an event like this makes me think about the, the, the interest in my field in big social data. It, uh, people are f uh, flocking to these kinds of data, uh, and, including 
uh, physicists, economic, ec economists, sociologists, and, and anybody who has an interest here. And it is amazing how you can do things now, um, like go to one of these Twitter meters and look at the regularity with which people write the word pub on Twitter, the daily, uh, the daily regulator, regularity with which they do that. And you can even correlate their use of the word pub with other uh, words um, in the same sentence. Um, just at the touch of a button, that is, that is an, an amazing uh, be, an analysis tool. And of course, this is very close to the, the new Google Ngrams tool that looks at 4% of, word, of words published in English since uh, the 1700s or, or before. But of course, many of you are familiar with um, diagrams like these, which at an instant kind of tell the whole story about uh, divisions in society and the real nature of social organization. Um, but uh, in, in, in other sciences of, of, uh, of, of herding behavior and, and animals, such as these uh, schooling fish, or this fairly well-known in my field, this study of, uh, of, of how spontaneous applause erupts or how people engage in Mexican waves, we know that people do not have to be knowledgeable about the global system or where things are going globally to, uh, to in, in, uh, impart a pattern of coherent direction. So these fish here in this school here are spiraling, but each fish is really just reacting to another fish, as are those people in the Mexican wave. They're just reacting to their neighbors. And what we find, or what, uh, and particularly what people like Ian Cousin and others at, at Princeton find, is you only have to introduce a small amount of direction into that, um, a, a small number of individuals who are actually moving in a directed way, and the rest will follow. But not in a Pied Piper sense, but in a sort of uh, chain reaction sense. They don't actually know where the Pied Piper is, but the whole school follows along uh, because a few elements within that school are actually acting independently and with purpose and direction. And I think there's a, there's a metaphor for that because we often think that um, all, it's Malcolm Gladwell, for example, is famous for espousing the model that um, certain ideas come from a center or, or are, are delineated out from, from hubs, social network hubs, for example, or mavens in the old days. Um, and that uh, ideas spread from certain particular individuals. And this, this is a radical departure from that because it's n there's nothing special about the individual who may, who may be imparting that, uh, that coherence to the movement, but um, except for the fact that uh, the individual is consistent with it. So, our, excuse that, uh, that typo there, an independent, but the, the, uh, the, the main message of our book here, this was our, one of our big messages here in this book, is that when we think about these different forms of social influence, it, it very much helped us, me, Mark Earls, um, and Mike O'Brien of uh, University of Missouri, it very much helped us to consider behavior on two different dimensions, and then we could actually derive from sales data or data on, on how often people are searching for things and so on, the kinds of data that come out of networks like Google Plus. Um, two, different, uh, two different directions here. The first is how independently or how socially are people acting? This makes a big difference. Um, if you're trying to, uh, for example, introduce a new behavior like a, a, a healthy new norm concerning sexual health or vaccines, one of, one of the things that, that I work on. How do we get people, young people to, uh, young girls to, uh, to use the HPV vaccine, for example? Um, it's very helpful to know whether they are thinking about this independently. Oh, it hurts, it's costly, um, uh, I don't know if it works. You know, all the kind of inherent uh, benefits and costs of, of the actual action. Or are they just doing as others do? Turns out in that case, they're actually listening to their mother, mostly, so, um, and that's the other dimension. I can, I can talk about social influence and independence on one axis, but how selective am I, am I particularly with that social influence is one of the most interesting things. So if I'm actually very selective in, in whom I listen to, like my, like my mother or father, we would plot that up in the upper right there, what we call the Northeast now. But if I'm just looking around and I might just point to someone in this room and adopt his outfit tomorrow, 
I would look, I would look fine. Um, that would be perfectly acceptable tomorrow. I don't need to be very su uh, selective in that sense. And uh, that might be somewhere down here. I'll have what she's having, so to speak. Now up here, that's classical economics. These are people, this is what's traditionally been assumed about decisions. We are, we make well-informed decisions, we weigh up costs and benefits, and we make those decisions independently. I know for some of you, you probably don't think this way, but it's still the, the uh, conventional wisdom in, in, in most economic approaches to things. And then just for completeness down here, you just take a guess. Sometimes we do that. I, I more or less did that when I bought these glasses because I was just confronted with a wall of glasses and I was standing there by myself, so I couldn't copy anyone, so I just chose one. Right. So this is important. It's important to know. So if we assume that uh, buzz about flu indicates that flu for, for real is actually very high incidence in a, in a, in a particular region, um, then we're making an assumption that people who are uh, writing about flu or, 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 or tech, uh, putting text online about w using the word flu are actually reflecting real activity around them. Now, it is much more effective now that, that the method for tracking flu has to do with texting when you actually observe someone with symptoms. That's a very good uh, step forward in that. But in, in, in earlier renditions, um, analysts were just using the frequency of a word to suggest that in, that in that area, a certain activity was common. And that assumes, that very, uh, very much assumes that we're not just reacting to people online, that we are actually observing things independently in the real world and then conveying that online. But what we found, um, we, what we found and I might get to, is um, that in the case of the swine flu scare of the last, last uh, of 2009, that the spread of the virus had really nothing to do with the spread of the meme about the virus, the spread of the panic about the virus around the world. Uh, so the, the, uh, the wisdom of crowds, and James Surowiecki made this point in his book, that it does require people to think independently, which um, by its very nature is, is often unusual in social networking contexts. It's, very, it's often very difficult to think independently in those contexts. I'll just give you an example, because um, we wanted to give kind of a long anthropological view of some of this. If we're thinking about uh, behavior that is social but is actually well informed, we might think about traditional societies, like hunter-gatherer societies, where uh, a young hunter might cop will, will know for sure who's the best hunter within his group and will and we'll learn from that. He's very well informed about uh, whom to learn from. Uh, also, social intelligence is very adaptive in traditional societies. So the, the Lamalera whalers shown there in the upper right um, are, are all uh, benefiting from their, uh, collectively, from their sharing the different tasks that are involved in, uh, in, in whale hunting. And of course, everyone's success depends on everyone else. And um, this, is, this has been the case for most of our prehistory. Just, just think about how odd it is that, um, that somebody would not know the street uh, just uh, 50 meters away, or that you could not know your neighbors physically. A lot of people don't. Um, and that we come from a history of knowing very, very well our relationships and our kin and our landscape. Uh, so, but in the, in the 20th century, we, um, we've experienced a long-term change towards people being influenced by people that they don't necessarily know. George Orwell was, was famously peeved by the use of copying of words by politicians um, in, his, in his essay, Politics in the English Language in the 40s. Uh, but also recently, Duncan Watts and his, uh, and his then graduate student, Matt Salganik, showed that when music downloading is, um, is visible to other people who are downloading music, predicting success in what becomes downloading is very, um, is, is, is very much more difficult. So in other words, they showed how social influence leads to much greater unpredictability. And that's because small things make a big difference. So for the H&M example um, from, the, from the last talk was, is a great example. It's, it's, it's not only difficult to know who's going to lead in the beginning, but it's also difficult to know whose page will be the biggest, let's say, three months from now, because so much is changing in these early, in these early days. And that's the, so it's a combination of, of, of random things that happen in the beginning, and then the snowball effect of social influence. <coughs> So um, there are a few tools that I'm just going to run through very quickly um, 
This, this whole categorization wouldn't be very relevant if we couldn't actually derive where things plot on this map, on this four box, from real sales data, for example, or real data from, um, from human behavior. Uh, the first is that, you know, you also, we, we now normally see uh, online charts of how, how popularity goes, and very simply, um, things that are chosen independently, like these presidents' names over the last century, spike up at first, and then they decline exponentially after that. And Britney was mentioned last time, Britney's 1998 album spiked, gave, it a, gave the name Britney a big boost in the U.S., but by now it's already back to where it was. It was on a, it was on a constant decline anyway. And uh, that's, that's another message from, that we do see from looking at so many data on popularity, is that this kind of boost, this kind of big splash that you can see, for example, on names, um, celebrity names, on, on names in general, is, um, is often very short-lived. And furthermore, it's very, very difficult. I actually had to, when looking at names, it, I actually had to look at US president names male names, which were unusual at the time, to actually find a, a good size boost um, in naming customs. But then we have on the right, we have lots of names that have undergone a nice symmetric rise and decline, like Charlene and Tricia and Christie. And those are, those are two indications that, that the, the um, events on the left are independent choice, whereas the events on the right are more of a social diffusion type of type of event. And that's my colleague Jonah Berger at the Wharton School um, in Philadelphia who did that uh, study of the, of the baby names on the right. So that's, that is um, potentially useful in the sense that we don't have time to look at all these data ourselves. A lot of these things kind of seem obvious after the fact, but the point is prediction is very hard and also there are just, there are just way too, much, too many data to see without some way of automating. And here's an example of bird flu. Uh, the being, Google searches for bird flu in 2005. People were panicked about it. It was, it was engaged in a sort of social diffusion at first. Then, boom, it takes a, sp a spike up and then does an exponential decay. And, and that was the moment, that was the day that George Bush, the then president, stood up and announced a, a $5 billion program to uh, research bird flu. So uh, you look at this and say, uh, yeah, well, no, duh. I mean, of course, a president's announcement is going to cause activity. But again, what we're interested here is, is in a way really for a way for an algorithm to tell you that, not necessarily humans. Um, and also to be able to delineate things, we often have many hindsight reasons for um, thinking that, that something caused an effect when really um, w it wouldn't happen the same way twice. So uh, another thing we can do is also uh, uh, look at, for example, countries and looking at uh, just the symmetry of the rise and decline of these different uh, peaks. So the panic about uh, swine flu in 2009, in April and May, took a few days to rise and a few days to decline in many countries here, and roughly we would call the social spread of that meme. In other countries, particularly Asian countries, these are all ab ab abbreviations for different Asian countries, Indonesia, Australia, um, U the United Emirates, and so on, <laughs> China. These are countries that had already had a bad experience with bird flu four years before. Uh, so they naturally reacted much more directly, much more independently to the news about H1N1 than did those European countries. And again, this is a crude tool to, to work together with people who do more in-depth qualitative research. This is not meant to be an end in its own. But this allows us to say, hey, what was it about China and Indonesia and, and Australia that was special about swine food? Did they have some sort of bad experience about it or what? And of course, we know that in Asia, um, bird flu was uh, more lethal than it was in the West. And so it does make sense. Um, OK, so I'm going uh, to close on another implication about this. There are really, really two um, dimensions of behavior, very simply, that I'm talking about here. We're being deliberately very simple about this because, um, because it can get so much more complicated. But this simple uh, interaction of, of some people inventing things new and most people copying uh, can have just small changes in the number of people who are inventing something new. Uh, it can have huge effects. 
So in the United States, the number of people, the, pr the proportion of people that invent new names that have never been used before is pretty low, about two or three percent. And most people, by nature, you choose a name that's been used by somebody or else it's a totally new name. So look at that map in 1960. In 1960, you can see each state is just colored by the most popular name in the state. And the most popular names in, in all states was either, was either James, David, Michael, John, or Robert. And also, if you would dig down, say, in the blue states and the southern states, James was the number one name, but David, Michael, John, and Robert made up, in some order, the top five. So it was a very homogeneous cultural landscape in 1960. Uh, and, uh, and by um, 2009, this has all changed. In 2009, we have this patchwork quilt of, uh, of states and the most popular names in every state. Um, this is even more so uh, from, last, from last year, but uh, even by 2009. And one of the things is not only is this more heterogeneous, but it's, it's deeper. So the, the number one name in Minnesota at this time was Logan. Um, that name is not even in the top 30 in California. So the differences are deeper. And you, can, and you can see how this can become realized. People can sometimes internalize this. Um, this. These differences, we believe, came up through a combination of sort of random changes, but then local social influence that, uh, that, uh, that, that consolidates these local changes. So it doesn't really have to happen for much of a reason, but once it does start to happen, then somebody from California, and picture this on all sorts of cultural um, axes, not just names, which we use because they're tractable. Someone from California looks at someone from Minnesota and says, wow, you're different. I mean, you called your kids Logan? We don't, we don't use that name over here. Um, and, and then things can become even more polarized. And I think, I, I hope you, th you can see where I might be going in terms of social networking because, um, you know, one question is, does it divide or, or, or integrate? Well, this is one way that, um, that social influence paradoxically can divide because um, if interactions are fairly local, but then you're also injecting a little bit of originality in there, which can get amplified and then cause bigger differences. And this is what we found too. We have, we, we're able to, to uh, model these, the, this information and extract out of that analysis what was the invention rate of new, game, new names. And what you can see is throughout the 20th century, Girls' names, the invention rate of girls' names was about 4%. The invention rate of boys' names was about 2%. Then something happens, and notably before the internet, really, in 1988, roughly, the, or the early 90s, and suddenly the invention rate takes off for both. It became culturally acceptable to n give your children new names or uh, unique new names. And that, that's something that's also been documented by a Harvard sociologist, Stanley Lieber, Lieberson. Um, and, and again, it happens before the internet, but what it, is, uh, what it reflects is in the old days, including in East London, there's a famous study from East London that showed that in the early 1900s, about a third of boys, uh, about a third of girls and even more boys were named after a parent. But by 1930 or 1940, uh, almost no girls, no, no fraction of girls were really named after their parent, and, and only a small proportion of boys, 10, 20 percent, were named after their fathers, their father. Um, and so Lieberson was talking about the 20th century as being a unique time when we, we actually have choice over things that we haven't had choice for per, pretty much our entire existence as human beings until the 20th century. To choose a unique name is really a, a rather anomalous thing. And now, for one reason or another, and, and I would welcome anybody who has an idea why this happened, but since the, the early 1990s, suddenly people are much, much more inventive. And what that, what that does, think about how much more inventive people can be online. What that does is get consolidated by, by social influence locally and leads to this, um, this uh, rather patchwork world that we now live in, which is not so different. Um, you know, you can see a, neighboring states there in that diagram, which are really quite different from one another. I wouldn't go into detail. New, you know, New Jersey is really quite different in their top list from surrounding states. But in a way, that's not really so different from me 
um, asking directions from somebody a half a block away from this building and him having no idea where Bow Street is. So now you can have neighboring states um, and, and they may have no real cultural connection with each other. And that is indeed, um, if you permit for, for, to extrapolate this, that is becoming the case um, in, for example, American politics. Now, it's a long stretch to go from baby names to politics, but you, the process really, I think, is a generic one, and it's something to be aware of. Um, so uh, I would finish with this, which is just looking at this map again. And uh, one of the things that, uh, that, that s searching online can do is maybe take, take something that originated down here through invention and I'll have what she's having and so on. But then what we do so often online is make top 10 lists. And that puts it up here. That makes it look like it was there for a reason. So the top name is in Minnesota is Logan. Well, there must be a reason for that. It's now the top name, it's on the list. Uh, and then in our minds, we reify that. We think, ah, Logan must be the best name. Um, but it, it doesn't necessarily have to be. It's the process of what we're doing that's, that's making, it, uh, making it that way. So I would close on that and, and, and advocate this kind of thinking about simple dimensions like this and thinking about how well informed are people making decisions and how independently are, making, are they making decisions. And once you do that, you can rule out a lot of uh, ex potential explanations for whatever it is that you're trying to research and focus more closely on, um, on what would be the real case. Thank you. Fantastic, thank you. <coughs> Cheers. Um, thank you very much, Alex. Um, next up we have Jerry. He's po po quite possibly got the most friends of anyone in this room. 10 million Facebook friends um, for uh, Craft of Cadbury. Um, and he's the guy who looks after the Cadbury's um, social profiles in the UK. Um, and also looks after European stuff. So he's going to be talking through his experience with Google Plus in the early days. So you're one of the earlier brands to, to really embrace this. Um, so Jerry, over to you. Thank you. But I think... Thank you for having me. Uh, I don't personally look after all 10 million fans, I'll be honest. Um, I work in the Cadbury UK team. I was brought on about two years ago to be the first sort of internal community manager um, around the... Uh, uh, London 2012 sponsorship, official treat provider, of course, um, and now part of the wider craft business. Um, I now advise on much wider things, but it's only the 2012 stuff I really get hands on with. Um, probably most of you know Cadbury, we make chocolate. If you haven't found any, there's some out there. Uh, maybe you know craft, maybe you don't. We the uh, craft as a, as a snacking business that also makes uh, biscuits, gum and candy, coffee, cheese and dairy, and something else. Um, and yeah, lots of really famous names, Kenko, uh, Oreo, uh, Toblerone. So it's a, a wonderful range of, of brands to work on. Um, and Cadbury as a, as a company and as a brand has always been very heavily active on social. I think it's, um, it's an easy place for us. We're selling chocolate, we're not selling insurance. So quite a lot of people uh, like to talk to us online. Um, and obviously here today, we're here to talk to you about our, our Google Plus page. Um, which isn't quite a million, isn't quite a million circulars yet, uh, but 300,000 is not bad going when we had uh, 2,000 at the start of the year, so we could hit a million fairly soon. Um, it's well worth adding us to your circles, it's probably more worth adding Oxfam, who I think are next, but uh, we're, quite, we're quite entertaining as well. Um, I'm not going to blow your minds here, I don't think we've done anything amazing on Google+, Plus. what we've done is taken kind of the wheels and the system that Google's built, and we've just tried to run with it. I think um, we work across a lot of different social platforms, and whenever we take one, we just try and find out what its strengths are, what works on it, uh, and try and play to them. So we haven't uh, blown the doors of it, we've just tried to make, make use of everything it does. Um, I'm gonna go quite fast, I've only got 10 minutes. Uh, like most things with Google, we started with search as, as a good reason to be on Google+. Plus. Um, well, if you need a good reason to be on Google+, Plus, there's going to be a billion people on it soon, so why aren't you on it? Um, but not sort of the SEO side of things, it's just looking at what people were saying about us, uh, and when brand pages were still kind of a, a glitter in the eye of someone in, a, in California, we used to search on, on Google+, Plus every couple of days, and see that every hour or so, someone was just naturally talking about Cadbury. Uh, like I say, we're one of those brands which has that going for us. Um, it felt like a fairly natural place for us to step into. Uh, it obviously is a much talked about SEO benefit as well. Um, one of my colleagues at Cadbury's has kind of devoted his entire life, I think, to getting Cadbury to be one of the top results when you search for chocolate recipes. 
Um, we're about number two behind the BBC, but when I search chocolate recipes, we're number one uh, because we have shared the page uh, and Google is in my circles. Well, Google, Cadbury's in my circles. So um, already I could, I could make his job a lot easier and just get him to circle us. Um, one of the things we've really learned from as a, as a brand, as a company, is, is Whisper. Um, again, if you've sort of lived in the UK a while, you're probably quite familiar with the brand. It was something we sold in the 80s uh, and stopped selling. Uh, not that controversially because people stopped buying it. Uh, but come, but come, the, come the noughties, there was this sudden sense of, oh my gosh, where on earth is Whisper gone? Uh, there was a Bebo, remember Bebo? There was a Bebo group set up to begin it. There was a Facebook group. Um, there was even, they even stormed the stage on Glastonbury, demanding we bring back Whisper. Um, I think it was quite eye-opening for the business at the time. Uh, there were 20,000 people in the group on Facebook, which at the time, I believe, was the biggest thing on Facebook that there was. Uh, we've moved on a bit since then. Um, and because we kind of jumped on this and we embraced it and set up a Whisper page and, and ran with it, we now kind of have basically two million Whisper fans. Uh, and the main reason we've done that is getting on something early and growing with the system. So I guess when it came to Google+, it felt like there was something we could learn there in terms of if you've got the resources, if you've got the energy, if you've got the content, why not give it a try and see what happens and, and try and grow with it? Um, and so far we are. Um, I think my favorite thing about Google+, and certainly from a kind of a brand perspective, is just how visual it is. Um, the kind of the sheer size of the thumbnails, the sheer um, strength that puts the YouTube clips, the nice way it kind of shows galleries. Um, pretty much if you don't put an image in your post, it sinks into nothingness in Google. On a Facebook and Twitter, you can kind of ask people how their morning is. On Google+, Plus, if you don't put a picture of your morning in there, no one sees it. Um, and for a brand that creates a lot of very visual, welcome to Joyville content, um, it's a great network for us to be able to show that. Um, which in particular highlights the importance of creating uh, content and visuals that people actually want to see. Because um, when you get down to the kind of the mechanics of Google+, the way other people hear about your page is when they share your posts. Now, we love chatting with our fans, we love commenting with them, we love it when they plus one our posts. But it's really when they share, when they click share and share it with their circles, that your page is kind of getting that, that extra reach, those ripples. So it's about finding things you can do on your page that people will like and be entertained so much by. Probably we should just be making people laugh, shouldn't we? And then, you know, back in the, oh gosh, don't hit my pocket. Um, so some of the, the fun things we've done, we, we launched a product on uh, Google+. Plus. We actually announced on several other social networks at the same time, but thank goodness some of the, the Mashable journalists aren't as thorough in their research as they'd like to be. Felt a bit guilty on that, so I've since launched a few other products on Google+, Plus, so we have definitely done it now. Um, and it was, it was massive, yeah, 550 shares, I mean, that's, that's massive. It was one of those, it became one of the kind of the hot topics on Google, and that was really when we started to see a lot of people come into our page. Uh, when we first launched, we created these kind of one kilogram dairy milk bars with a sort of plus one logo one, and we gave one away as a kind of a, a competition. And then when we hit 200,000 followers quite recently, we, we gave another one away, um, and that was shared pretty wildly. And we've done some other weird things, like we did the world's first ever chocolate mobile phone unboxing. I mean, as I, as I keep saying, we're privileged as a brand to have really exciting, fun visual content, uh, and Google Plus is a network that really brings that to life. Taking it one step further and coming back to those ripples, uh, the way those shares really make an impact is obviously if the person sharing your post has a lot of people who follow him. Take, for instance, Vic, who runs slash invented Google Plus, maybe, um, and he, we sent, we, uh, we took this learning that I guess on Twitter, one of the, the key things is it's people that are powerful. No brand has a million followers on Twitter. No brand yet has a million followers on Google+, Plus, but Britney Spears does, Lady Gaga does on Twitter. It's still individuals people really like to connect with. Um, brands are always playing in this dangerous territory where it's a social space, you're here to talk with friends, you're here to talk with people you know. Brands really have to add some value. And, and on Google to begin with, maybe not so much anymore, the, the real influencers were people who worked at Google. Now they're no longer the biggest people. I think we're seeing that it's really moving into the mainstream. But so Larry and Sergey and Vic were some of the key people. And we produced about, about a dozen of these different bars for some of the key influencers. Uh, and Vic was the main one that posted it, but it really kind of generated some buzz. And as much as anything, it generated quite a lot of love for us in Google. It's probably why I'm standing here today, because we haven't, we haven't done anything else since. So. <laughs> I think there's just a few people angling for a bar, so we'll, we'll see how that goes. But I mean, yeah, really, and we've done a similar thing on, on other social networks where if you can tap into the people, and by clicking on that ripples feature, you can really see the people who are sharing your posts, or perhaps go to a brand that's posts are being shared and see who's sharing theirs, and then try and nick that person off them. Um, <laughs> circles, I mean, I think we've, we've talked about circles a lot, both from a kind of psychological point of view and from a kind of how you use them point of view, and they are, they are a powerful part of the system. 
I think there are lots of ways they could, and hopefully will sort of develop and be uh, made even better for brands. But for instance, we have a, a founders circle that was kind of the first few people to add to our page and some of the most engaged since then. And it's just a way for us to really talk quite actively with a, with a core group of people who like hearing from us more than is healthy, um, without drowning out everyone else in the entire room. And for instance, the second slash first product that we announced on Google+, Plus, we announced just to those founders. And um, we've announced various other things, just to these kind of core groups of fans. So perhaps the whole world hasn't seen them, but people who we really want to engage with and reward have. Um, we're also trying to build up some brand-specific circles. Um, and as I say, you can't do anything without a good image, so we did a bit of design work there. But there are people who like Cadbury, yes, but there are also people who like Cream Egg and people who like Dairy Milk and people who love Whisper. And on a lot of other platforms, you kind of have to go and create a whole new account for these different things. One of the great things about uh, circles on Google Plus is you can join our Cream Egg circle, and we can tell you loads and loads about Cream Egg. And everyone else on the page only has to hear about Cream Egg occasionally. Um, at the moment, you kind of have to do that by asking people if they want to, and then clicking one by one and adding them in. But I'm sure that's changing. <laughs> it's definitely changing. It's actually quite insightful, though, because, I mean, much as I joke about how long it... I, we, I added a 1,000 people to our founder circle. I just want to say that. That was a, a long night. But what it really showed was actually that a lot of the people who we did add to our founder circle didn't work at Google, didn't live in America. A, lot of them, a few of them we knew from our Facebook page, but actually just lived in the UK and quite liked chocolate. Um, which was a relief because some people suggested otherwise. Um, and yeah, there, we've also done some stuff with temporary circles. So we'll chat about Hangouts in a second, but when we created a, a, a Hangout circle, it was a way of us sort of asking people who wanted to hang out with someone and putting those people in a, in a short circle. And we just started chatting to just those sort of 20, 30 people about like the practicalities of a Hangout. Have they checked their webcam? Are they going to be here at 4 o'clock tomorrow? Um, what are they going to ask? Uh, what are they going to be wearing? Are they going to be wearing something? Do they speak English? Um, and it just meant that we could have quite an in-depth and fairly boring conversation with a group of people. And instead of having to take that to email or go somewhere else, we just did it on our page. And for people who weren't in that circle, they just they couldn't see it. They didn't know what was going on. So yes, which brings us out to Hangouts. I think um, Hangouts are a pretty cool thing. Uh, we did one with um, Sinead Reed. She's a four times BMX world champion. Um, she's one of the athletes we sponsor as official treat provider to the London 2012 Olympic and Paralympic Games. Uh, <laughs> I say that every now and then. Uh, and we just, it was a really great opportunity for people. I mean, we had a bunch of random people. We had some bike website. We had a few random people. We had Josh, who I work with, uh, dialing in. So um, we, it was just a real chance for admittedly like nine or ten people just to speak and hang out with an athlete, really bring them closer to something they wouldn't normally um, touch. Um, and of course we share it on YouTube and I think today it's had, it's had about over 3,000 hits, so it's not like the viral sensation that was the drumming gorilla, but it's still quite a really a good number of people who've seen kind of a really in-depth um, engagement with our brand and with our Olympic message. And most of all, it was, it was no effort at all. We kind of, we talked it over for weeks and weeks, what will we do, what will we say, who will be in it? Um, at the end of the day, we had Sinead's for a photo shoot. We kind of, at the end of the day came, and we were like, hey, Sinead, do you mind hanging out with us? Sat in front of a webcam, me in the room next door, like, uh, moderating. Um, and, we just, and we just chatted away. And I think the biggest eye-opening thing for us is that they don't have to be a hassle. Sometimes, instead of just posting something on the wall, you can just start hanging out. Um, and that might be a direction we try and take things in once corporate affairs approve. <laughs> Well, the good, if, the good thing is, if you, if you don't do an on-air hangout, only the eight or nine people within the hangout can see how badly you get it wrong. And then by the time you share it to YouTube, you can edit out the bits where you say stupid things, which is why in this hangout, if you watch it online, I say only very sensible things, because uh, I edited it. Um, I think it just is my, my last slide, and it really is just about for us trying out new features. There's a time a couple of months ago they announced the kind of so-called meme generator, where you could just put text on the bottom of any photo and kind of instantly create a meme. Now, we're not funny enough to create one of our own, so instead we asked our, our fans. We put up some caption competitions that there's no prize, um, and some of them just came up with great examples. Uh, this is from our Goo Games stuff, so the, the opening ceremony won't be the last time eggs get beaten in the Goo Games. Um, and we just, yeah, we rewarded one of our fans who'd, who'd done that with a, with a, a shout-out and posting his image up. And we've also started going in that kind of famously Facebook direction of creating and building apps and stuff. Um, at the start of the year, we, we did something with the London 2012 mascots where you could kind of take a pledge and promise to play more games in the, uh, in the year ahead. And we built an app, and we built it so you could log in with Facebook, but we also made it so you could log in with Google+, so people could log in, enter the competition, and share that pledge to their wall. Um, that's a fairly basic application, but I think certainly kind of 
gaming and that side of things is, is definitely going to be the way to go. So for us, it's kind of been a learning experience. I think, like I say, we haven't done anything too radical, but we've just taken the features and the stuff that works on Google+, and we've tried to run with it. Um, we have got 300,000 people in our circles, which is a bit mad, uh, and hopefully that continues to grow, and we will hit a million, but it could easily stop any moment, so I won't say that. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you for having us. So, so, Jerry, you're promising everyone in the room uh, a kilo bar, yeah? If they post on the... Uh... have a small one out there. Yeah, okay. Thank you very much. Um, next up, we have um, Chris uh, Terry from uh, Oxfam, who's the online marketing manager. Uh, also an ex-Googler, so I'm led to believe. I am, yeah. Fantastic. Never, never Microphone. Um, so, um, Chris is going to... He hasn't even got any slides, have you? So, nope. Chris is going to talk about how Oxfam are using Google Plus to get closer to... Um, Get their, their donors closer to the sort of the, the front line of what you guys do out in out in the field. So, hand over to you. So yeah, so no slides. I uh, hope you can all hear me. Um, I'm just going to briefly. There's a screenshot of us. So I do have a slide. So that's nice. Um, so we've just been using Google Plus for about three weeks, really. We were previously kind of reposting things we were doing on Facebook, and we. To give some background, charities, obviously we don't have too much money to splash out. What we do have as Oxfam though is a lot of content because we run projects out in the field as you'd call it. There's a lot of photos that comes back from it. We also have celebrity supporters. We do have kind of a, the people who are interested in Oxfam are involved with Oxfam or could be more involved with Oxfam as in they have kind of a, a demonstrable in affinity with us. They're giving us money. We probably don't share enough of what we do with people. So this was the issue. And we've all sat around trying to think of cheap ways of sharing more, kind of building a community around, uh, around our supporters, and of course, getting new supporters coming. The other big problem for charities like Oxfam is we used to be able to get out onto I don't know, the 10 o'clock news, 9 o'clock news, uh, the one show, sitting on a sofa with someone. Now it's I hate to say it, it's weird being a charity and saying things like competition, but it's highly competitive, uh, whether it's other charities or more likely brands who are trying to show they're charitable and have, you know, buy our water, we'll give money to people. So the competition has increased in the last 10 years. We have all of this content, we can't get it out. We were putting things on Facebook, we've got a Twitter feed, what everyone's doing. So what did we decide to do? We thought of something that was free, and was suitable for all of this content. And we're still using Facebook, we're still using Twitter. But something like Google Plus has turned out to be quite a good solution. To put these numbers in perspective, now I think it's over 30,000 today, probably about now. In three weeks, we only have 70,000 followers on Facebook, and that's been years in developing. So, what are we doing to do this? We're using, at the moment, Google Plus to post videos directly from a supporter who has gone out to Zimbabwe, actually. And so you can view her videos now on our Google Plus page. But this is more just a testing phase to get people interested in our page. Uh, Google, actually, if you sign up for a Google Plus page, Google choose some of the more interesting pages to recommend. We've got on there because we put some interesting content up. But really, the big plan is actually around some of the features you've been hearing about Google Plus. So, after this trip, people have questions of the person out in the field. How's the money being spent? What did you think about this? Just sort of general questions that would come up. They're going to be able to have a hangout with the supporter coming back from the field. But that's not really a big sell for many people. It will be for people who have given money to that project. What will be a big sell is we have things like Oxjam, um, which if people don't know, is where people organize festivals. Um, and then all the money from the festivals go to uh, Oxford. Oxford, Oxford. Yeah, that's Robin, yeah. yeah exactly. <laughs> but, and um, so bet behind Oxjam, there's people like Coldplay, or then you've got Fatboy Slim, whatever his real name is. People like this who are prepared to do hangouts with uh, anyone. So we'll be able to advertise through other channels, plus our Google Plus page. Hey, look, win. Um, an opportunity to discuss with Coldplay uh, how to set up a successful band, or more likely, have a live jam session with members of Coldplay. And this will happen through uh, the Hangouts that you've seen happening today. 
So just all of these different opportunities through Google Plus have just been kind of an inspiration to use it, and it's free. So that was really good. OK, so, um, so I'm not trying to get them off the stage now. Uh -huh. um, the idea is, because we have no slides, we're doing a bit of a QA. and a So um, I've got the first question for you, and then hopefully someone from the audience will follow with some more cool. questions. Is how do you um, record ROI for social? So looking at the, the ideas here, how do you <laughs> quantify your efforts behind? Well, that was a tough question to start off with. Oh, yeah. So, um, oh, I for social. Uh, well, we're first of all looking off at just building the awareness in the first place. So, getting up to these 30,000 fans. The final ask will be to get people to donate to Oxfam. And um, we'll be obviously traditionally linking in from Google Plus the traffic that is coming to a set up page on the Oxfam website and there's a direct ask on that. So everything from Google Plus here in the short term has a direct response ask, in effect. Once this trip ends, there will be, you've been following the trip, find out more here at Oxfam GB, and come in and there's a direct ask for money. But this isn't something we want to do on social because we don't want to scare people off. Hence the kind of link to come to Oxfam GB, and then, then the ask happens. We don't want to be seeing as social kind of come and follow us because we want your money. Come and follow us because there's interesting content. You have chances to talk to people, interact, and see where your money goes if you do so choose to give us money. Great, that thank helps. you. Yeah, it does. Um, any questions from the floor? Yeah. Considering, oh. ah, Considering you said you had 70,000 people in your Facebook page mm -hmm. for years, what is it that you've specifically done in Google Plus to have 30,000 in a few weeks? So I think it's actually a bit of a credit to Google Plus is that um, our photo content, it's a shame we can't show you live, we have excellent photos that come mainly from people going out and shooting documentaries. And just the way that these photos are shown on, thank you very much, on Google Plus is, is it's really uh, like kind of excellent. It, it's really nice. And so when Facebook, it gets a bit lost, you know, it becomes just a regular update on the wall. How much do people really interact? Here, people are coming to the page, and they can click photos. And it's, it's really kind of almost inspiring, I hope. Um, and it has obviously helped, because the content's good. We're getting interaction around it. We're then getting kind of some leading figures. And the Google actual, the Google UK, Google Plus page, has shared some of our work, which has kind of led to increased interactions, which is excellent. Right. Any more questions? Any more? Yeah. So you haven't actually, uh, from, from your page, have a, a button that will allow people to donate then, there and then, or do you? Um, not on the Google Plus page, we don't. Um, it's something that we could do, so to give you background on working on charity, it's always a very fine balance between asking for donations and, and interacting with people. And it normally actually falls, probably I'm a bit hard-nosed for a charity, it's normally people never really ask for donations, and we really should, but, but we don't at the moment on the G-plus mm. page. Okay, I've got one more question for me. Um, okay, <laughs> thanks, Sam. Um, are you planning to do any hangouts like live from, from the, an actual operation out in Africa or Asia? Or? Um, so we're hoping to. Uh, this trip at the moment, um, it, it's this trip has been used because it was the one that was happening. Um, so it is just sending a supporter out to see how, how money's been spent. It's part of a wider um, kind of TV advertising campaign that will come along. Any other questions? Hi. Yeah, I just wanted to ask what's actually happened to your um, Oxfam website then. Do you, do you not use your actual uh, Oxfam website anymore? Because we, mm. it seems like you've kind of transferred everything to here. Uh, what happens? I just wanted to know what happened on that side. It's a really good question. And so we haven't transferred everything to Google+. Plus. It's just so you find most of you, I'm sure, in the same situation. You have Facebook, Twitter, and your, your general advertising. Everything is coming. Dis disparate almost. What we do and we make sure we do is that we always link back, we used to own all the content, we always link back to where it's being hosted uh, on the Google page. 
this is just seen as another way and a more effective way in many, in many ways of engaging with people who either are interested in Oxfam or we feel could be interested in Oxfam. Uh, it's just another way of getting the message out. But yes, the final, all content may not be here on Google+, Plus, but it will always link back to um, Oxfam GB. It's definitely not a replacement, no. It's just, it's an effective way of both marketing and engaging and talking to potential and actual supporters. Is it the same kind Sorry. of content? Is it the same kind of tone of voice that you're using um, on Google Plus as it is on Facebook, as it is on Twitter? It's not now, actually. We're concentrating in Google Plus on videos and photos um, and less of a marketing message. Uh, on Facebook, there's always, so for people who don't know Oxfam, we almost do too many things. So it's not like WaterAid that can just say people need water. We have a vast range of things going on, which means our Facebook page has become slightly, we're running we need people to enter the London Marathon, enter and give us money. And there's almost too many updates, too many different subjects. This Google Plus is being used as a more, we have interesting multimedia content. Come, come and have a look at it. And then people will share. OK, question at the back there, gentleman in the white shirt. Hi, are you finding it takes longer to um, sort of moderate stuff and engage on Google Plus than on Facebook? Or like, have you changed the amount of time that you're having to spend or allocate between them? Um, it was actually, so, got to be honest, I'm not directly uploading or anything. I've managed to take a back seat a little bit. But previously, we were um, just almost replicating everything that happened on Facebook to Google Plus anyway. So. This, this switch of focus, I think, is actually taking us a bit less time because we're uploading less. Uh, we've been more selective of what we do upload, and we're letting the community police itself to an extent, which is a whole other conversation. OK. Question, gentleman there in the blue top, just around the corner. Hi there. Hi. Um, for a, a Google Plus brand page, is there anything that is like Facebook Insights for a brand page, you know, where you can see insights on the, the demographics and that kind of... Uh... So we have... Um, it's working. Thank you. We have ripples that you might have seen earlier, and we do have... Um, we're working on a, a tool that will um, we'll have a lot more insight into your data, and that's coming soon. Thanks. <laughs> It is actually a problem we've, we've found, is that um, some of our videos aren't, um, for various reasons, aren't directly hosted onto YouTube, which would have been great, but just a few that have gone up have gone straight onto Google+, and we can't see how many views they've had at the moment. <laughs> but, but yeah. Okay, any more questions? No? Thank you very much. Cheers. Fantastic. So um, thank you very much today, and thank you very much to our speakers. So I think um, uh, Robin and Alex gave us some big, hairy problems to think about, some scary things about um, you know, my in-laws are more close to me than my personal friends, and the further I move away, the worse it gets. Um, there's some great stories there about, uh, I mean, the, the Hangouts, Beth, fantastic, very amusing. Harry's dog was a star. Um, and again, thank you to our, some of our advertisers as well for talking about their experiences on Google+. Plus. So. Um, after this, I'm not sure, where's Sam? Are we, we're almost run over time now, haven't we? But we've got a little breakout area over time. So we've got uh, uh, analog circles, so Polaroid photos. You can put your photos um, uh, and, and, and share them with each other in terms of whether you're a lovely, a trendsetter, et cetera. We have lots of chocolates, lots of Cadbury's, lots of other stuff as well. Uh, and Beth and some of the team are also there to demo the tools and ask, answer any questions. So thank you very much for your time. <laughs>